so welcome uh, to all of you and uh, welcome to this uh, panel discussion focus in physics and the title of the discussion is uh, rapid response intelligent answer how the infra uh, large scale uh, research infrastructure promotes innovation and sustainability so this event has been organized by Electra Synchrotron Trieste uh, as you see uh, from the video uh, Electra is uh, a large scale research infrastructure and uh, we uh, designed built and maintain at a high technological level two um, sources, two light sources. So we have two big machines in which electrons are accelerated to very high speed, close to the speed of light. And then uh, they emit uh, uh, light from the infrared to the uh, X-rays. Uh, and uh, we have one synchrotron, which is uh, um, a machine in which uh, the electrons uh, travel, um, circulate in a ring, and uh, um, the light emitted is collected uh, by 28 uh, different laboratories that use this light, which is very uh, brilliant. So the number of uh, photons per unit of volume is uh, uh, extremely high and uh, um, is used to study the interaction of matter also bio with biological matter and uh, um, to get uh, details at the microscopic level. The other machine is uh, the laser, the uh, free electron laser uh, named Fermi and it produced the um, light in pulses which are extremely short the length the time length of one pulse is of the order of one millionth of billionth of a second of femtosecond which is uh, um, i mean at the time scale at which the chemical reaction take place and uh, uh, not only that the brilliance is particularly high so this pulse is uh, um, uh, as brilliant as billion to billion uh, times uh, uh, the sun. So with this particular light, we can uh, uh, take snapshot of chemical reactions and from those understand uh, the uh, how do the molecules interact among them um, with, uh, um, I mean, focusing on their structural changes uh, and uh, function uh, that they adopt. So uh, it's a large scale facility uh, because we, um, we built a big machine that is for the entire community. There are uh, scientists from all over Europe and beyond coming every year to use this uh, light. And we have more than 1,000 collab different collaborations per year in fields, different type of fields, uh, which go from materials, uh, protein structure, uh, biology, drug discovery, delivery, and so on. Uh, so today we will discuss uh, uh, in particular, so unfortunately, uh, the original idea was to have two guests and unfortunately professor Amina Taleb she's the scientific director for matter sciences uh, at the synchrotron a similar synchrotron to ours uh, uh, um, but is located in Paris in Soleil uh, called Soleil and uh, uh, for health reason I was unable to join but we had the honor to have uh, uh, here uh, professor, uh, professor Majed Sergi, and uh, is uh, uh, from is a physicist, full professor at the uh, Ecole Polytechnique uh, Federal Lausanne, and uh, uh, is uh, the head of the Center for Ultrafast Science. And the focus will be on how to use these uh, ultra fast pulses of light to get information on uh, uh, on the matter. So, um, Professor uh, Shergi is uh, um, uh, born, was born in Morocco, but is a Swiss and French citizen. 
speaks fluently, included Italian, seven languages, and uh, um, studied uh, all over uh, in many different places in the world because uh, did his uh, undergraduate studies in London, then moved to uh, Paris for the PhD, uh, to the University Paris Sud in Orsay, and then uh, got the um, uh, position as associate researcher at the uh, National Research Center, French Research Center, but also then was appointed uh, um, associate professor in Berlin and then moved in Lausanne in 93. And uh, um, even taking the center of this uh, scientific gravity in Lausanne, I managed to uh, start many collaborations uh, in uh, uh, many different places, uh, including Electra. So we are very lucky because uh, uh, Professor Shergi is uh, a, a user of Electra and uh, is, uh, um, uh, I mean, uh, is uh, inspiring uh, a, a generation of young researchers uh, also at Electra uh, for uh, pursuing this uh, uh, basic research in this field. Uh, I think I will uh, leave uh, uh, the floor to you, to Professor Shergi, to uh, Describe the science. He will tell us more about the his the science is doing and this uh, uh, personal um, story uh, within science. Well, thanks very much, uh, Loredana, and thanks uh, for the organizers of this nice event for the invitation. Uh, I think I have a few slides which I prepared to kind of start the discussion. And since this is supposed to be a round table, even though the table is not round, uh, don't hesitate to ask questions. I'm not going to hammer you with heavy science, but uh, just to give you some ideas about what we do. But I prefer to do it standing. And uh, yeah. so this works. Yes. OK, so Loredana, I'm not going to irradiate you with a laser. Don't worry. <laughs> OK. So uh, usually, uh, so I, I am a physicist, as Loredana said, and I work in the field of ultra-fast phenomena. So we look at very, very short times on the typically femtosecond to uh, picosecond time scale. So as she said, the femtosecond is a billionth of a millionth of a second, or if you want it on a human scale, one, sec one femtosecond is to a second, what a second is to 32 million years. So I hope this scales the thing. Now I like to, if you know, to to start many of my seminars with this uh, with a slide uh, because I like cats very much, but not only that because I find this beautiful a beautiful example of how you know uh, curiosity driven science intellectual activity can lead to many uh, very impactful uh, developments. This gentleman Etienne Jules Marais is the inventor of cinematography in the sense that he developed the first shutter camera. He was not interested in doing uh, films. He was, a, he's, he was a physiologist, French physio physiologist and anatomist, and he was working on animal motion. So he developed this shutter camera, which is called the, the fusil photographique, the photographic gun. Maybe the expression in English to shoot the film comes from here, I don't know. And with this, he used to go and, uh, and, and, and you know, look at the animal motion of different types. He did very beautiful snapshots of, what did I do here? Okay, so, uh, yeah, he did very beautiful snapshots of, um, of cats. This is a more recent one you can see. Uh, and, uh, and with this, he really started the entire film industry and movie making. It's, it's really a, a big revolution, but it started by the interest in looking at uh, you know, uh, motion of animals. Now, um, later in his life, he also started getting interested in fluid motion. So he was making these beautiful films of uh, fluid flow between two glass plates. Anyway, just to come back to the ultra fast phenomena, imagine this cat, which uh, typically would be like, uh, oh, no, this thing doesn't go. Ah, okay, yes. So, uh, typically 30 centimeters long, and you use uh, a shutter camera with a... Okay, I, I think before the end of the talk, I will give it... Uh, with, a, with a shutter speed of one millisecond. Now, if you scale down 
the size of the cat to the size of an uh, interatomic bond. This is a bit large, but it's okay. Then you will get two picoseconds. So basically, when you look at ultra fast phenomena, it's because you're looking at very small objects, very small distances. That's, uh, that's all what is in it. Now, um, okay, so am I going to get this right now? Okay. Uh, so it's not the only example of, uh, you know, curiosity driven scientific activity that uh, leads to major developments. And uh, I tried, and this is beyond large scale facilities. I, I tried to uh, make a list here, which I gleaned myself, you know, uh, through, through what I know uh, of fundamental research that led to major industrial innovations. Of course, the discovery of the X-ray is, is from the end of the 19th century. The Haber-Bosch process in chemistry gave rise to a, a, a revolution in agriculture, transistors, and, and there are many other examples. I'm not listing all of them, but these are the ones that came to my mind. Uh, in the telecom, spin echo, I love this one because spin echo is such a fundamental physical phenomenon that was discovered by these gentlemen in 1949. And like 35 years later, it was becoming, it became one of the major um, imaging techniques in, in medicine. We think, how the hell did these guys go from this discovery all the way to MRI imaging? And that led actually to uh, two more Nobel Prizes. Actually, the last two, like um, uh, Richard Ernst and Kurt Butrich were in Switzerland for the development of MRI. <clears throat> The laser, no need to mention uh, the importance of the laser. And for example, more recently, giant magnetic resistance for uh, data storage and CDs. So you see that all these works were really uh, done uh, without thinking about the applications. So I really want to insist that if, and, and many politicians don't always understand this, if you want to have innovation in industry and, and new developments, you have to uh, really uh, do fundamental research. You don't get, well, innovation, if you already know the process, it's engineering is all due respect. Okay, so um, now to come back to what I am interested in and, and, and get closer to large scale installations, uh, again, <laughs> I'm really, um, I like to cite this this uh, this sentence by Francis Crick, the the guy who discovered with uh, Watson the double helix DNA structure. If you want to understand function study structure, and in, in a way he was fully right, and there are many many techniques that allow you to get structure, static structure, steady state structure. Uh, X-ray crystallography is one of the most known. Electron microscopy, which was recognized again by uh, a, a, Serena, a Nobel Prize in 2017, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance and, and so on. Um, and you get structures of very, very complex objects. And this technique has in particular, the use of X-ray uh, crystallography at synchrotrons at large scale uh, facilities has led to a huge number of uh, Nobel Prizes. Uh, I'm again, these are the ones that I could glean myself, but paradoxically, and I, I think this is a suggestion for uh, Eletra, one should have a page where you show uh, the list of all Nobel Prizes that are related to large scale facilities. You don't find it actually. Uh, Stanford has one, but it's more for their Nobel Prizes, like Conberg uh, here, who got it from, from his work in Stanford. But anyway, this is what I had to glean through the through my uh, own uh, uh, research. And you see these are all very important, mostly in biology, but not only. Uh, for example, this one was a discovery of uh, quasi-crystals uh, and what was the other, there must be some others. But anyway, yeah, this one is a GF green fluorescence protein. It sounds biological, but it's very uh, chemical physics. Anyway, all these were obtained thanks to research done fully or partly at uh, large scale facilities. Um, okay, now am I getting, now the reality is that, uh, can, you, can you click on this, uh, uh, on this picture? The reality is, as you know, that, uh, no, it doesn't work. Ah, oh, yes, it should work. But anyway, okay. 
reality is moving all the time. Huh? You are not. We are not static structures. And this this was a film that shows you the transport of water through this uh, aquaporin uh, channel in a cell membrane. Doesn't matter if it doesn't work. But anyway, uh, at, at the end of the day, one one should say if you want to understand function, study time dependent structures, uh, which which include, of course, also knowing the static structure. So. This is uh, quite an important thing. Now, to come back to the time dimension, as I told you, uh, the length scales and time scales go together. So it depends what you need to study. I mean, if you're looking at animal motion, as we said, millisecond would be enough. If you're looking at the level of proteins, like the respiratory function, you you have to go to microseconds when uh, you, you know you pick up oxygen. Uh, if you look at fluorescence materials, for example, these are all lifetimes of light in the nanosecond. And now you start entering the scale of the molecule. If you want to look at, for example, phenomena like vision, where you have a photon that enters your eye and excites this uh, uh, photoactive molecule in your uh, retina called retinal. And this one, this molecule undergoes a nice summarization, a change of uh, shape like the cat I showed you before, in about 200 femtoseconds, less than 200 femtoseconds. And, um, and then you can go to even, uh, uh, you know, interatomic motions, and interatomic motions are always at very, very short time scales. And the lighter the atom, the faster the oscillation period. Um, and, and therefore, <clears throat> uh, for example, in the case of water, the stretch vibration is 10 femtoseconds, but if you take a heavy molecule like uh, iodine, I2, it's uh, like 300 femtoseconds. So it depends on what you are studying, but basically, if you want to look at the, at the molecular motion, which is what I'm interested in, but also in solids at interatomic motions like phonons and optical or acoustics, you have to be in the femtosecond and the, uh, and the picosecond. And then you can go now with uh, new uh, light sources, uh, attosecond light sources, you can go to to the uh, um, attosecond, sorry. This is the time scale of the electron motion in the atoms. Uh, I don't do this, but uh, there are many uh, developments in this range. Now, I told you about the time. This is all the time, and I would call this the atomic scale of time. Actually, I'm, I'm quoting Ahmed Zawail, who got the Nobel Prize for his development of femtosecond spectroscopy. Uh, but now you want to also see objects uh, at the atomic scale of lengths of distances, which is the angstrom. And for this, you need to have uh, to have um, light sources that go both into the angstrom range and the femtosecond range. So I'm just jumping here. So the development of lasers. Uh, first, before the laser, you had these techniques based all on electronics that could go down to a few tens of picoseconds resolution, and that gave rise to a first Nobel Prize. But then with the advent of the laser, we quickly reached the femtosecond domain, and that gave rise to the no Nobel Prize to uh, the wave. But this was all done with optical pulses. Optical, I mean uh, infrared, UV, uh, ultraviolet, visible. And these are hundreds of nanometers. Now you cannot resolve the distance between two uh, two atoms in a molecule, which is a few angstrom, with a wave that is like 200 or 400 nanometers. You need to have a wave that is as short as a bomb distance. And that's why you have to uh, use uh, sources of X-rays because the uh, wavelengths of the X-rays is in the angstrom range, like what you do here at the Letra. And then you need pulsed, Elect, uh, pulsed sources of such X-rays. So until recently, about 10 years ago, we only had synchrotrons like Eletra, and that delivers tens of picosecond pulses. Uh, and then there was a scheme that was introduced that allowed to reach femtoseconds, which uh, we used at the end of the 2000s. Uh, but then around 2010, the first uh, free electron laser came into operation. And now you can go down to attoseconds with free electron lasers while being in this range of the X-rays. So you have really uh, now brought the atomic scale of distance or length and time together. And now you can really look at time evolving uh, structures. 
Okay, so this is uh, this is a general consideration about large scale facilities. Uh, as we've just seen in the film, um, large scale facilities are not only interested for the research that you are doing, you or me or or uh, Carlo, but they are also because they are uh, technology intensive. They're really hubs for uh, developing all sorts of new uh, technologies, and that's why. Uh, in a way, they are funded. I mean, two examples. The most famous one is the World Wide Web, which was developed at CERN. Uh, CERN did not patent the World Wide Web, but had they done it, it would have been the most, the richest, uh, the wealthiest territory in the world, much more than, uh, you know, oil emirates. Um, but they didn't do it. Okay, so it was developed there, and it was a, 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 a software for their intra-CERN communication, which then became a world, uh, a world web. Uh, and then the other example that came to my mind is a Nobel Prize to Georges Charpak, who developed detectors for elementary particles, but then these ended up both in the field of astronomy, but also in the field of uh, medicine for doing, uh, you know, tomography of the brain, because these were like uh, 3D um, uh, uh, detectors. But you have a lot of new, uh, I mean, new, uh, uh, schemes uh, in 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 these different areas, and I haven't listed everything here. So it's uh, it's really uh, quite amazing as hubs for new technologies. Okay, so now I, uh, my own trajectory was uh, was uh, using large scale facilities. So as Loredana said, I, I after my studies in England, I went to France to do my PhD, and. Um, Initially, I, I had started to study mathematics and physics, then I switched to a major in physics. And when I finished, I, I kind of was not so interested in doing theoretical work. So I drifted more and more towards, uh, towards uh, you know, experimental work. And so I registered and, and started the work in, in, um, in molecular physics. And the idea was to do astrophysics. But then I, I get vertigo when I look at the sky during the night when it's full of stars. I, I really get anguished, <laughs> like someone looking down a bridge. So I said, no, I cannot, I cannot do uh, astrophysics. I would, be, I would go nuts. So I decided to do more uh, conventional molecular physics, and I started working at synchrotrons. In the 70s, at the end of the 70s, the synchrotrons, there were very few in the world. And they were recycled machines from high energy physics. So they were storage ring that people, uh, and, um, and there was an old machine at uh, Orsay, which has been dismantled in the bean time. And, um, and so I started working there, but this, the, the setup was not adequate. So I got in touch with uh, a group in Germany and I made an arrangement that I would go and do measurements there. Uh, and and Daisy is a big center now. It's completely dedicated to photon science, but at that time it was really one of the big high energy physics centers. And we were allowed to use a synchrotron because for the high energy physics this was a loss of energy of the charged particles, and so they used to call us the parasitic users, and they were really treating us badly. I mean, they would you know they would say, okay, you can get beam time in second week of May. And then you turn up, no, 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 we need the machine for high energy physics experiments, you cannot. So sometimes I would go to Hamburg from Paris to do experiments and then we would be uh, uh, basically turned down. Uh, but anyway, it was a, a very interesting experience uh, at that time. And then later, when I moved to Berlin, I, I worked on the local uh, synchrotron. Uh, gradually, synchrotron stopped being used by high energy physics. And uh, all these big centers, like the Polcher Institute in Switzerland and the uh, DAISY in, in Germany, and I think uh, what else? Well, I, some some centers in the U.S. also uh, have completely turned into uh, synchrotron or light uh, photon science uh, related uh, uh, research, and they build now synchrotrons just for the uh, uh, use of the light characteristics that go from the infrared. To the x-ray they are quite uh, impressive so uh, in 1987 i moved to berlin i worked there six years and i started also doing laser-based experiments in parallel to the synchrotron experiments and then when i moved to um, to, to switzerland in 1993 i 
decided to develop my own uh, ultra-fast laser spectroscopy lab. The reason being that uh, the, the birth of femtosecond spectroscopy can be dated back to 1988. And for some uh, reason, I became very good friend with Ahmed Zawail, the pioneer. And he, come, you know, I, I was so fascinated by doing these experiments that I, I wanted to set, it, set up a lab by myself. But I was not my own boss when I was in Berlin, so I had to wait to move to Lausanne and start my own lab. But then soon after, I realized that, you know, combining lasers with synchrotrons, at that time there were no free electron lasers, would be a very, very nice avenue uh, to uh, do structural dynamics, structural studies of molecules as they move. Now, I have to tell you one thing which is interesting. I discovered the uh, X-ray spectroscopy, or in a way, not discovered, but I, I heard a talk in 1980, I think, by a, a gentleman, Pierre Lagarde, who's quite known in the field about X-ray spectroscopy. And I did not understand anything, but I got the message. It's very important when you give a talk, give a message, the information, anyone can come and ask you. So this guy said, you can get the local structure around specific atoms because you're looking at specific atoms in the system. And so you, from the analysis of the spectrum, you get the local structure. That's the only thing that I got from this talk. I was half asleep during the talk, I must say. But anyway, 15 years later, when I started my own lab uh, in ultrafast spectroscopy, I said, wow, this is the thing to do. Why not combine lasers with X-ray spectroscopy? There were people already, I don't pretend to, 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 to be the first, but there were people doing the, the, the classical structural study uh, uh, technique that you use, you know, like I showed, is X-ray crystallography. X-ray crystallography is scattering of light. It's not absorption or emission. And, and so everybody was trying to do X-ray scattering, but I wasn't interested in X-ray scattering because uh, you need a crystal and not all molecular systems can be crystallized. So I wanted to do, look at the structure of systems in solution. And that's why I remember this message by Pierre Lagarde from 1980. And I thought, okay, good. Now I'm going to combine the two together. Uh, the, the, the other thing which is interesting is, again, don't forget, short time scales go with short distance scales. X-ray spectroscopy is, is sensitive to the short distances. And since I was interested in short time scales, I said, why should I care about X-ray scattering, which gives you indeed the global structure of objects. But if you are looking at fast, short times, you are looking locally. You are not looking at the global structure. So it was a really a, a good uh, match. At that time, there were no free electron lasers and there were no sources of femtosecond tunable X-ray pulses. You need tunable, that is that you can change the energy if you want to do spectroscopy. It's not like scattering, you can use one single energy and look at the scattering of light. So uh, at that time there was no, apart from the uh, synchrotrons, we said, okay, well, we have only the synchrotron that can provide short pulses. And these pulses are 50 picoseconds typically, much longer than the, uh, maybe I'm taking all the time now, much, much longer than the, the 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 uh, femtosecond that I was interested in, but we said, okay, never mind. Let's establish the technology or the methodology rather uh, with uh, synchrotron pulses, and then maybe one day there will be femtosecond pulses. In fact, they they did come, and uh, later uh, between 2005 and 2010, we managed to do the first femtosecond X-ray absorption spectroscopy, also at synchrotrons with a scheme I mentioned before. But this scheme was quickly abandoned because from 2010, we started the picosecond and femtosecond uh, studies uh, at free electron lasers. And the free electron lasers compared to, I mean, at that time when we did the experiments, we had, uh, it maybe doesn't tell you anything, but we had 10 photons per pulse in about 100 femtoseconds. And at a free electron laser, you get uh, 10 orders of magnitude, so 10 to the power 11 or 10 to the power 12 photons per pulse on the, during the same duration. So, you, you know, it's a, it's a big game changer. And, and, and now, uh, I mean, ever since we've been involved uh, with this, uh, uh, you know, uh, activity in, in different forms, maybe we can discuss if you have uh, questions afterwards. 
So these are the backup slides. I'm not going to show them to you. And I thank you for your attention. Majed, for this uh, very nice and inspiring overview of the research uh, you, you have uh, performed during your career. By the way, is uh, uh, I went through the uh, CV of um, Professor Sergi, and it's more than 40 pages. He published the, almost 400 papers in uh, his own careers, so, so many chapters of books and there's been uh, I got many awards and uh, uh, how many papers you published uh, thanks uh, to the uh, large-scale uh, facility work you had performed the work you had performed at the large-scale facility with respect to the work that you had performed in labs uh, Okay, ah, thanks. Thanks uh, for the question. Uh, in fact, I started since most of my career has been based on, on, uh, on large scale installations. Most of my papers are from there. But I would say uh, when I managed to have my own laser lab, systematically we were doing laser studies before going to the synchrotron or later to the free electron laser. And uh, usually you say, okay, well, I'm going to characterize a sample with some laser experiments. And in the end, you always end up finding something new. So typically for each paper published at the synchrotron or free electron laser, there were two, at least two papers based on laser only experiments. So I don't know, I, I never counted them to be honest. <laughs> Just a curiosity in mind. And uh, I mean, uh, um, beside the, the um, technology, because of course, uh, uh, large scale infrastructure are unique places in terms of the developed technology, a, a free electron laser. We have few in Europe, so, uh, in Europe, so it's uh, uh, important uh, from uh, a technological point of view to work at a large scale facility. But uh, um, I mean, uh, uh, what about the uh, um, cultural environment that you found at a large scale facility? Can you comment uh, on this? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, this is a different way of working and I uh, encourage young people to do it because uh, you, you interact with a lot of people uh, not only on the international scene, but different categories of uh, professions also. Uh, and the fact that I used uh, synchrotrons in France, uh, Germany, Switzerland, Italy, yeah, where else? I don't remember. Oh yeah, US, of course. Uh, it's, it's clear that it does, uh, does bring, uh, uh, um, you know, it's, it's a very enriching experience and, and it's, uh, and, and it's different to the lab-based work, which is very enriching too. You meet a lot of people. I mean, you really meet a lot of people because you come across a lot of people. I mean, these are uh, centers where people converge to and uh, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, uh, I remember when I started uh, going to Hamburg in the beginning of the eighties, uh, it, was, it was quite special. I mean, some, some experiences were quite, uh, quite uh, unusual uh, for someone who is starting, you know, you're not used to this type of uh, melting pot in a way. It's very, very, very nice. Uh, did it uh, help also to enrich uh, the language of science? Because uh, we are continuously, I mean, uh, saying that uh, there are many different languages of science. Of for instance, biology has a huge complexity while the the physicists look at the simplification of yeah. the complexity but sometimes physicists simplify too much and in biology cannot uh, this simplification sometimes is not possible because mm, yeah. there are uh, variables that uh, must be evaluated together no 
did uh, an environment like, uh, I mean, uh, Electra or uh, another synchrotron, free electron laser that you found, uh, uh, do you have any particular experience in which uh, meeting a different uh, type of uh, people with different uh, background and expertise in the same Absolutely. place uh, has been uh, important uh, for progress also yeah. in the in the specific research? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the 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 in a way, I would say this exceptional confluence of people uh, is is really uh, for uh, cross fertilization is extremely uh, beneficial i mean i uh, some some subjects were born out of or some collaborations were born out of uh, meeting someone down the corridor at three in the night uh, to get a coffee to keep awake during the measurements and then that's it it starts there and then uh, it went it went on for years i mean in that respect i think it's it's quite it's, it's a special environment. At the beginning, if you, I remember when I was a student, I saw this big machine and said, "Oh my God, you know, what am I? You know, I'm just a, a piece of dust in this." Uh, but then, but then, once you you get used to it, it's not so uh, it's not so frightening. <laughs> it's uh, it's on the contrary, it's very very enriching. One more question uh, before uh, I mean asking uh, the the audience. Um, large scale facilities are big investments, okay? And uh, there are uh, attempts now to evaluate the cost benefit of these uh, large scale infrastructure. So uh, people trying to find ways to measure the benefit uh, to the society of the, the impact and the benefit to the society, not only the technological or scientific, yes. but beyond that, you know, in terms of uh, sustainability goal or all these uh, uh, things. Uh, thing. Um, what's your, I mean, uh, <laughs> what's your idea about that? What do you think about that? Uh, I think, you know, I'll be frank with you, quantifying intellectual uh, output or output, the word is not good. Intellectual activity is, is, not, is not really what I, I, I understand that people want to do it. But uh, but uh, it can be very misleading, and some sometimes it can lead us into a, 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 a you know um, gosh how do you say Pudosak. sagasa in German <laughs> yeah and and yes and anyway so in in, in the road without the, you know without the stradas and so she document okay. <laughs> So, so I think I think it's a bit tricky, you know, and uh, and there are many examples where, uh, you know, I, I was we were mentioning the case of uh, uh, Geim and the bottom of uh, who discovered the uh, graphene uh, materials, which are extremely popular nowadays, and I think it's Geim who had uh, maybe it's in his Nobel lecture uh, who explained that uh, at the age of uh, like thirty five he had an H index of one or two. I mean, he would have been he would have been burnt in a scientific career uh, nowadays, but here the guy got the Nobel Prize. You see, so it's very dangerous to uh, define or quantify. I don't say that one should not evaluate, but uh, putting numbers on on how good the uh, productivity, intellectual productivity is, is very dangerous, in my opinion. So now to come back to your question specifically for large scale facilities. I mean, I show this list of uh, Nobel Prizes that uh, arose from uh, uh, the use of uh, synchrotrons. There are no, in my, to my knowledge, uh, from the free electron lasers, but they are barely 10 years old. So maybe they will come, maybe Trieste or some place. Yeah, maybe Carlo. <laughs> but, um, but so one has to wait uh, to see what, uh, what, how, how it spins. But, but this is something we can, with difficulty quantify, so you can say, okay, so many numbers of uh, of, uh, of of Nobel prizes. Uh, there are many spin-off companies, detectors, optics. Uh, I don't know, but 
I know that at Fermi you do have, uh, at Eletra you do have a number, but uh, the Paul Scherer Institute in Switzerland, uh, detector uh, companies, one of them has grown into a big company now that was based on work done there. And there was, uh, there's another uh, spin-off in the X-ray optics, in the field of X-ray optics, developing extremely novel uh, optics. So these are the things I, you can put on paper and quantify. But beyond that, I think the impact is much deeper and that we cannot predict. <clears throat> so, I mean, uh, if you want to uh, leave these uh, young researchers uh, starting uh, a career right now with uh, some take home message uh, uh, in, in the respect of doing the basic science uh, with respect to, to uh, work for some application, specific yeah. application, uh, uh, according to your experience. <laughs> so uh, basic science for uh, applications is like a, a contradictory statement. You cannot. <laughs> basic science is basic science, and it can spin into some fantastic, again, I gave some examples, some uh, amazing applications, but you cannot say, okay, I'm going to do, however, it's good to have a roadmap. Nowadays, when you write a proposal, they ask you, you know, why? Of course, they, people will ask you, why do you want to do this or that research? You can have a roadmap that is, okay, I want to study photovoltaics for solar energy conversion. It's very loadable. This is perfect and it should be done. I think it's good. But it, what is important when you, when, you, when you do science is what you find on the way and you have to be curious. Uh, really, uh, you have to be, because once you're doing your research, aiming at uh, maybe developing a photovoltaic cell, it's what you find on the way that is uh, more interesting. And sometimes you deviate from the initial official target that you put in the proposal, uh, and then you end up with some much more exciting results, you know. I like to cite the uh, Spanish poet, uh, Antonio Machado, El Camino se hace caminando, you know, <laughs> but you have, you know, you have a light there that you want to reach, but then you have to make the way through and making the way through, you develop new, new, uh, you de discover new things. And you have to be curious and passionate about what you do. I think this is the best road to success. Don't worry, the rest follows. Um, uh... From the audience, uh, are there questions, uh, curiosity, um, both about the uh, science uh, and, uh, I mean, the more general uh, um, discussion about uh, what science, uh, how science should, uh, should be performed and operate. Nobody start. <laughs> yes, very good. <laughs> because you already ask a lot of questions, so like it's hard to um, start with another thing, but maybe let's maybe. Okay, you partially asked for this question, but let me let me ask me uh, you um, this question in another way. I mean, some take home message, some like some advice for young researchers, young scientists who want to like enroll to PhD, start deep science, and like we are somehow aware that it's a very hard thing to do, but still we want to do. But like, how to not? I don't know. Do not give up during the during our future experience and adventure you mentioned like some um, about your scientific uh, scientific history that like you had some problems in like uh, it was uh, not humble but like different psychotron and so on like so maybe your advice is how to not give up okay i can tell you my my, my own stuff. so 
you, you, one thing I said is you have to be curious and you have to be passionate about what you do. But I have to confess, uh, it's not easy always to keep uh, to keep uh, uh, online. And I, I, I can tell you what happened to me when I finished my studies and I started a PhD. I got really depressed after the first year because I had a supervisor who was totally disconnected from what I was doing. And somehow I didn't know why he had hired me. And after a year, I gave up. I, I really gave up uh, science and I uh, enrolled in economics. <laughs> I, I, and, and they were very happy to have a physicist uh, enrolling in e economics to do a master's degree in, e in economics that was in Paris and Nanterre. But then another guy in the same lab with whom I, I used to get along quite well and then later became my supervisor, uh, told me, uh, you know, you're doing something really stupid there, you know, don't go, you should stay. And he went, he was behind me for two months. And, you know, deep down, I had always thought, you know, when I grow, I will be a scientist. So I had, it was not a, it was not a, an easy decision to switch. And then, so in the end, I, I went back to science. So, and then I stayed with this guy, but he himself was also not so into the details of what I was doing. So I grew with a lot of independence. I had to find even my own funding to go to Germany and do the measurements. So it was a tough time. And, uh, and you, you know, you, I, I barely had a, a grant to, to do my studies uh, that time in, in Paris. It was very difficult to get funding like now. <laughs> it's never changed. This has, it's, a, it's an invariant of science. Getting funding is always a problem. But, um, but somehow, you know, it, it was, uh, you know, I thought I, I have to keep it. Now, the fact of not having a, a, a very, you know, um, a close supervisor, I felt it like, um, in a way, a difficulty. But then in retrospect, I think it was an advantage because then I became very independent. I, I, I kind of did everything by myself. I decided what I was going to measure uh, what subject and uh, and so when I did my habilitation, uh, I was completely independent. I was doing my own thing, and uh, you know I had no. And and my my official supervisor was a very nice guy, very brilliant. He was a theoretician in addition. Um, was was just uh, on paper. You know. So you have to believe in it, and you have to. Uh, I, it's difficult to say. You know, there, there is no. There is no, re in addition, it depends on the people. There is no recipe, but <clears throat> if, you, if you like what you do and if you are curious and if you want to really, you know, uh, move ahead, it's tough. It's like crossing the desert and <laughs> or being like a, a, a missionary, you know, you have to go through it. But in the end, uh, it's, it's rewarding. It's enjoyable. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think I answered your your question. <laughs> yes, I think you totally answered, but like it's thank you for sharing also this experience because yes. a lot of young young PhD students are like facing with the depression or other like states of <laughs> mm. uh, psychological health. But yeah, thank you very much. You totally asked for that. But on the other side, it's somehow it's a it's a pity that we need to take, choose between the independence and depression and other states. <laughs> yeah, okay, my case was a bit extreme because I was, I was really left by myself, but uh, I never left my students by themselves. In fact, uh, I, I became uh, too, too um, you know, some, some colleagues told me that I was over pampering my, my, <laughs> my PhD students. The, because having gone through this myself, I was always careful to be present. And you know, you don't need to give too many advices, just listen. It's good to have someone you can, that listens to you when you're, uh, when you're a student. And you know, just the fact of speaking helps a lot. Luckily, because I was independent, I started looking around with whom could I uh, have you know, uh, discussion partners and uh, in the in the in the CNRS in the GNR the French GNR at that time, people had more time to discuss nice science. So I used to go to other universities 
get in touch with other people and discuss with them my problems because I knew this guy had studied this system. So maybe I should go in. Uh, and some have become friends, very good friends, and they, they have helped me a lot. So in a way, you know, don't don't hesitate to contact people outside and uh, and and don't worry. You know, even if the guy is a big boss, in general, they won't be bothered by being contacted. They like, I mean, at least I like being contacted. By the PhD is the right time to start your own yes, connection yes, yes. because this start, connection will support your, you. In the, make your the own connections, career. make your own connections. And don't worry, you know, you will go through ups and downs, but it's not only in physics. Yeah. It's in any, any, any activity in life. You go through ups and downs and you have to... You have to co continue, you know. <laughs> Carlo? Carlo. Mentioning the, the, the difference uh, between basic research and, uh, and applied research, and I'm sure you have seen how this has changed over the many years that you have been in science. And, uh, Wonder if you could comment a little bit more about that. Is doing is the difference between doing basic science and uh, applied science, or even in industrial applications, the same forty years ago or or today? And how do you see it for the future? I think I think it hasn't changed. The nature of the activity hasn't changed. It's a pressure maybe to go more into into uh, you know doing applications but i don't think it has changed uh, so much of course i mean it depends what you call industrial research because you have a lot of research that is kind of borderline where there are processes i mean with your brother we did some nice things about uh, you know nanoparticles uh, we wanted to patent actually this activity uh, but but um, if you have to develop a device this is this is really applied research. Uh, but if you are looking into what could become a device, let's say for photovoltaics or photo or optoelectronics or whatever, um, then yeah, I, I wouldn't say this is, uh, I would still classify this as uh, fundamental science, but you maybe to get funding, you have to justify it with some scope. And I think it's fine to justify things with a scope. I mean, no, no problem. You know, you can write things in the introduction that you are going to make oil cheaper or uh, <laughs> or uh, generate gas uh, out of nothing. But uh, but I think that the nature of the transfer from fundamental to applied hasn't really changed much. And a lot of, you know, uh, you, we were talking about uh, Giovanni Dietler, for example, who was doing. AFM uh, spectroscopy and uh, AFM studies. Uh, so at some point he developed the, the, his AFM tips and the machine and uh, some feedback loop. And then he patented or not, he patented. Actually, he started a company uh, and uh, on, based on this discovery and then the company got bought. So, and this was pure fundamental research, but in doing fundamental research, you have to develop, uh, you know, setups and uh, um, technology or, or adapt technology to, to do a certain thing. And that then can become an application. I don't know if I answered your question, but. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, not necessarily. I mean, you, you can go into research and then maybe branch out. I mean, you know, in the 1990s, there was, uh, the young people don't, don't know that maybe, but in the 1990s, there was a revolution with, uh, with physics students, I mean, physics studies, in the sense that, uh, and as you mentioned, uh, in the sense that it, other sectors of the economy, the banking or, you know, um, 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 industrial companies discovered that physicists were, were quite interesting people uh, because they were not tied to the object. They were tied to the, to the function of the, 
whatever they had to. So, so there was a big, well, of course, the com computer software and all this swallowed a lot of the students. In fact, it was a big crisis in the mid 1990s because we weren't getting enough PhD students. They were all going into banking or, uh, or uh, computing or whatever, you know. They were really being hired left and right, and they are still being hired left and right. And that's, that was really a, a, a revolution because before that, well, it depends on the countries, but especially in Latin countries, if you were doing physics studies, it was either to become a teacher or to become a scientist, or, you know, a researcher. And going into an industry was not really, you know, I don't know how it is in Italy, but in France, it was really very, very extreme in that respect that uh, they were not hiring physicists, but now they are, you know, they find jobs very, very easily. So that means, of course, that takes you away from science. But um, if you want to stay in science, of course, then you, it's academic research. Unfortunately, big industries, again, that happened in the 1990s, like, you know, uh, Bell Labs and uh, IBM, uh, all these big companies that used to have fundamental research. They had, I, I still remember people doing really very basic research uh, in these labs in the 80s and 90s. They all decided to close down these departments and, uh, you know, no longer hire, you know, pure basic scientists. But that doesn't mean that the possibilities are closed and there are still many. If you want to go on into pure research, then it's academia or national labs like here. someone no. so i have a question are you all physicists no okay good and the, what what are the other subjects chemistry yeah i mean i'm a physicist and nobody's perfect i know <laughs> but um, but i work a lot on chemical and biological systems so it kind of drifted away <clears throat> ah, okay mathematics very good nice yeah so now it's uh, much more common and now that physicists work together with uh, i mean uh, scientists from other fields yeah. so yeah, yeah. biophysics for instance is yes. something yeah. that uh, developed uh, quite 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 ma quite a lot yeah. during the last uh, 10 years by, so. by the way the list of Nobel prizes out of the synchrotrons most of them are physicists yeah so they drifted into biology yeah, the revolution of the structural biology was performed by physicists yeah. the technique uh, and the interpretation of the data yeah. came entirely from uh, physicists uh, so structural biology the, the, the structure of proteins uh, through x-rays and now also cryo electron microscopy yes. it's, uh, it's uh, yes. entirely i mean done uh, was entirely done by physicists uh, but in close collaboration with uh, biologists biotechnologists uh, yeah hola Hola, vale. Hey, hello. Uh, thank you very much for that quote, uh, Anthony Machado. Uh, here from Madrid, and uh, yeah. Uh, well, I, I would like I would like to ask um, while you work in the ultra fast uh, technology and the stuff, um, and uh, every single year we we are able to catch like. A short periods like better images. Uh, my question is um, if we uh, go to the nanoparticle field and we use this technology, what kind of um, uh, in, in Castellano, si eh, ¿qué tipo de <laughs> eh, procesos? Podemos eh, descubrir, es decir, está, eh, o sea, nos da una visión mucho más próxima de lo que, lo que ocurre sí. cuando, por ejemplo, un láser impacta una partícula 
eh, el, el hecho de poder tener eh, este tipo de láseres con pulsos tan, tan cortos, eh, ¿tú crees que esto nos va a llegar a, a descubrir un, a un tipo de fenómeno nuevo eh, que ocurre en esos periodos tan cortos de tiempo? Porque al fin y al cabo estamos hablando de, de cosas muy, muy sutiles. Sí. Uh, did, sorry did, for did everyone, did, did everyone get the, the question? Yeah. So, so uh, what, what's your name, Michael? Ismael. So I was asking uh, uh, if you go in, into the very short time domain and uh, you are studying nanosystems, what type of discoveries uh, one could uh, expect? Well, actually, this question is is uh, is not possible. I mean. I work with nanoparticles too, and we do a lot of ultra fast work. And uh, the idea, most of what we do is to characterize the charge carrier dynamics. So you, you create, uh, you excite a nanoparticle, you create charges, and you want to see how they relax. Um, and, and that depends on the nature of the material. So structurally, electronically, magnetically also, uh, there are many, many different properties. So you cannot, you cannot anticipate a specific discovery because if you expect it, then then it's not a discovery. <laughs> if, I, if you see what I mean, uh, but but it's uh, but definitely you can. It it does provide a lot of information about what's going on in these nanoparticles. You also have to go to short time scales because again, you are looking at small objects. You see. So you want to understand what's going on there uh, on, on the very short time scales, and you have effects which are, you know, confinement, quantum confinement effects that come into play, which are very important, very fast. Uh, these are all questions. I mean, this is a very open question uh, that you can deal with uh, ultra short uh, spectroscopy. Yes, I mean, uh, it's uh, one of the a very broad, very broad area of research nowadays, including with X-rays. In fact, we are looking into these things because one one aspect of uh, the nanoscale is that <clears throat> when you have uh, transport phenomena, charges, or magnetism, or uh, heat, the nature of the transport changes with the size that you're looking at. So you could have uh, at very short distance scales ballistic transport and at longer ones uh, diffusive you see and and so one has to be very very careful about uh, how you describe these things and there are not many techniques that allow you to see you know the nature of these transport uh, uh, properties and so we are we are developing with colleagues from here and uh, from the Paul Scher Institute uh, an x-ray based technique to look at the very very short distance distances on the nanoscale sub nanoscales uh, even to to look at the the dynamics of uh, charge carriers and this is one aspect which is quite fascinating thanks for the question <clears throat> hello thank you for the inspiring talk um I wanted to ask, you talked about fundamental research and about the importance and of, yeah, of mm, researching with curiosity, not only applications. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you, how do you think the world, the, the world of research now is being influenced by the relevance of applied science? I mean, for example, the other day at the synchrotron, uh, the the researcher who showed us yeah. the the facility talked about many many see kind of many places of many places taken by projects that are looking for chips and conducting materials everything kind of more focused on commercial things how do you think it's influencing the research world yeah <clears throat> so i think many of the discoveries as i said were were not meant to be done specifically in this or that area you, you sometimes the the findings that you make during the research uh, are wholly unexpected and uh, completely uh, in another direction to what you initially had um 
in in terms of uh, of, of uh, you know uh, in, in you know what I mean basically we already discussed uh, this point. Um, it's important to have a goal. It's important to have a goal. Now, maybe you reach this goal and you're happy, and that is an applied goal. Uh, but again, as I said, it's more interesting to look at what you find on the way, and, and that is. Uh, is is not something you can really predict. I, I I know I will frustrate a lot of people for not being more deterministic, but I'm sorry. This is the way intellectual activity goes. <laughs> you again, you have to be curious and you have to be uh, to to have a certain passion and ask yourself the good questions, or the simple questions. In fact, why is this so? You know, why why do I see this color, or why do uh, you know? Uh, I like the example. My 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 boss, the the, the second boss I had was uh, from India, and uh, his name was Van Kataraman Chandra Sekaran. Now you have heard about the Raman effect, right? And the Raman effect, it's a C V, the initials of uh, Raman, C V Raman. In fact, C V meant C V meant Chandra Sekaran Van Kataraman. So basically, the inversion of my boss's uh, name and surname. And in fact, he was the last PhD student of Raman. And the example of I like also very much is uh, how did Raman discover the Raman effect? He was asking himself, why is the color of the sea blue? <laughs> and Rayleigh had given a, an explanation at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, that it was basically due to scattering the, the color of the um, of the sky, but you know, uh, the blue is uh, the sea is blue. It could be grayish, but it's blue in general, whatever the sky is, cloudy or not. So uh, Raman was cruising through the Mediterranean, and he decided to do an experiment and to look at the color of the of the surface of the water at Brewster angle, and then he saw it was blue. <laughs> so. Then when he went back to India after visiting England, he, he started digging into this problem. And that's how we discovered the inelastic scattering of light. So just to tell you that this guy was cruising, going to England from the Suez Canal uh, through the Mediterranean. And he was looking at the beautiful Mediterranean like you have here. And uh, that's it, <laughs> you know. So you have to ask the right question and, uh, you know, and dig. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, regarding to looking into such nano, like very, very small scales, have you found properties that cannot be explained in a large scale due to emergent properties or something? What do you do? Do you change the whole theory looking in a large scale or do you try to explain it again or what do you do? Yeah, that's that's a great question. In fact, the best thing is to find something anomalous when you're doing research. If it's not explained by theory, that means there's something to dig into uh, or by known models. In fact, we do have uh, in exactly the example I was giving to Ismail, right? Uh, about the trans uh, charge transport. We found some, some properties which were, um, you know, very unexpected of the change of regime on the nanoscale between ballistic and diffusive transport. And we model this with existing series, but they are not adequate. So we published the paper, it's not a problem, but uh, but uh, we were a bit frustrated. The theory was not there and we did not find theoreticians who would be willing to do it because it was a bit of a complex problem. But that's that's where it shows you that, uh, you know, uh, if, you have, if you have an anomaly, anomalies are the most interesting things in science, not the regular stuff. I, uh, thank you for your advices. I want to ask you if during your experiments, have you ever interact with uh, vacuum fluctuations, energy time in the in the terminals? Because you do experiments for a very short time. Mm -hmm. So if you have a very short time, you have also in determination of energy 
yes. creation of particles and the particles. Yes, so do you do you interact with this? Of course, this yeah. is absolutely essential. Yeah. But that was uh, that was a problem solved already at the beginning of femtosecond spectroscopy by Ahmed Zawail, because you're right. If you have a, a short, temporarily short pulse, it's uh, uh, spectrally or energy-wise, it's very broad. So. And so traditional spectroscopists that use very narrow band, uh, very high resolution energy resolution spectroscopy, like you do absorption or emission. They were very, very critical of the uh, of the development of femtosecond spectroscopy because they kept saying, "Oh, but you lose all the information. Uh, your pulses are too broad." But then, that's where it becomes more exciting than doing traditional spectroscopy. Is uh, when you come with a short pulse that is, let's say, you have a molecule that vibrates at certain frequencies. If the vibrational period is uh, longer than the duration of the pulse, when you come with this large pulse, and imagine you have a vibrational level here, yeah? several vibrational levels, the short pulse is going to span an energy beyond the spacing between these levels. And so what you are going to do is to excite a wave packet. You create a coherence because all these different levels are locked together by the excitation pulse. And then they start evolving. So what you're doing to the system is you are, you are basically um, touching the correspondence principle where your quantum object becomes classical. It starts oscillating like a nice oscillator with a spring between the two balls, you know, just like that. It will dephase at some point and then you lose the information. Now, why is this so much more interesting? It, it, in fact, it becomes a tool for high resolution spectroscopy because you, when you go into regions like polyatomic molecules or like some solids where you have a density of state is so high that you cannot with even the highest spectral resolution distinguish a level from the other. Well, you come with a short pulse, you excite everybody together, you will get these beautiful wave packets you do the Fourier transformation, you are back into the frequency domain and you have all the information you want. So Ahmed Zawail demonstrated this because he was being attacked by traditional spectroscopists for, uh, for using broad, uh, spectrally broad pulses and that uh, you know, it was washing out all the spectroscopic information. But in fact, you know, it's, uh, he wrote actually a short article in Nature with a nice title, The Fog That Wasn't. So people said, oh, you know, you lose information, it's like fog, but he said, the fog is not there. <laughs> in fact, you, you, get, you get back the information in, with, more, with more precision because short spacings mean low energies, i.e. long periods. You don't even need a femtosecond pulse. You can do it even with a picosecond pulse. Fantastic. So yes, you, you, you dwell on these considerations a lot. Absolutely, yeah. It's a fundamental thank aspect. You. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, So this journey towards the ultra small and ultra fast. And uh, let's uh, thank the professor. Thank you. And thanks, thanks very much for all the questions. Thank you. Thank you.